Welcome to our webinar on applying uh, grid enhancing technologies to accelerate renewable energy integration. I'm Will Poland, Senior Director of the United States Energy Association. It's my pleasure to welcome you here. I want to give a shout out to everyone around the world who's joining us and a particularly warm welcome to the members of our uh, Black Sea Regional Transmission Planning Project and our Electricity Market Initiative Working Groups both of whom are in the process of conducting major uh, transmission planning studies and uh, whom I thought would benefit greatly from this remarkable new study that the Brattle Group has, uh, has published recently. And I can tell you it's getting a lot of attention around the world. I see our colleagues Jay and Bruce speaking at many events, uh, including several that I've, I've been uh, privileged to attend in Europe. So, USCA is pleased to be able to bring you this uh, this special webinar. Before we begin, I'm, uh, I'd like to ask our acting, acting Executive Director, Sheila Hollis, to make some welcoming remarks. Sheila has joined us um, over the past year uh, upon the untimely death of our long-term Executive Director, Barry Worthington, but Sheila brings a wealth of experience in her own right as a lawyer, as the uh, Chairman of the Energy Bar uh, uh, Committee of the, uh, of the Bar Association. Uh, and an enthusiasm that we're all just feeding off of at USEA. So Sheila, we're really pleased to have you uh, this early morning on the East Coast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Will, and it's a, an honor and a delight to join you on this important topic. Uh, yes, uh, USEA is, uh, is here. We are pleased to host this uh, wonderful program this morning. And just a little bit for those of you who may not be able to uh, have looked back into uh, what USEA does. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan, non lobbying organization, a rarity in Washington, founded almost 100 years ago. USEA's mission really has two strong pillars of equal importance. Domestically, we serve as a resource by convening uh, energy stakeholders to share policy, scientific, technological information that fosters the advancement of the entire energy sector. Internationally, USEA supports global energy development by expanding safe, affordable, and clean energy access in partnership with the US government, a la what we are doing today. As a domestic energy uh, industry resource, we host webinars, briefings, workshops, fly. We have five flagship uh, forums per year, uh, and we offer a totally nonpartisan, unbiased platform for the expression of ideas, concerns, and solutions regarding all relevant energy issues. We strive to inform and promote a positive, effective dialogue on a path forward uh, in our energy and environmental related issues. USAA partners with USAID. It's an honor and a pleasure uh, to do that. Uh, and it is uh, a, a very significant part of our raison d'etre. Uh, the U.S. State Department and the U.S. Department of Energy as well we partner with. And we to, our goal is to help expand uh, safe, secure, uh, environmentally acceptable uh, energy access worldwide. Uh, our member entities include more than 100 organizations from uh, the across the specter of energy sector uh, of all sorts of energy, including governmental entities, nonprofits, Fortune 500 companies that encompass every type of energy source. Our international specialists work all over the world hand in hand with USAID and engage those members uh, to execute projects worldwide including the development of regulatory frameworks and sharing of best practices to reduce energy poverty throughout the world and help build economic growth. It's a tremendous honor to be playing a small part uh, this morning, and I look forward to hearing from our great uh, panel with their very profound insights on uh, improving the grid uh, resiliency, improving grid, grid access. So thank you very much for having me. Sheila, thank you so much for joining us today, and um, it's a pleasure to have you uh, at, at all of our programs. Uh, now, I, as Sheila mentioned, um, USEA has had a longstanding partnership with our colleagues at the U.S. Agency for International Development, a program that I manage called the Energy Technology and Governance Program, in one form or another has been a cooperative relationship with USAID uh, for more than 30, almost 30 years. Uh, working in the uh, region of the world called what that we call Europe and Eurasia to promote uh, energy sector reform, market development, ensure that there's adequate uh, transmission capacity to support markets. And we've had the privilege and honor of working uh, with our colleague at USAID, uh, Dr. Steve Burns, 
uh, who is the uh, Chief of the Office of Energy and Infrastructure for the Bureau of Europe and Eurasia. So Steve, I'd like to ask you if you'd like to make some welcoming remarks on behalf of the agency. Thank you, Will. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the invite. Thank you, Sheila. Jay, thank you for your insights today. I, I think this is going to be a great conversation. Uh, I think I'm, uh, we're really pleased, right, to support this webinar on, on grid enhancing technologies. And as Will mentioned, this is just one step in a long and, and, and fruitful partnership that we've had for you know, nearly 30 years now. I mean, uh, with, with regard to some of the specific work we're doing today, uh, this I think grew out of a, a lot of the initial modeling and transmission system planning work that, that began in Southeast Europe and the Black Sea region, you know, in, in the late 90s and, and early 2000s, where we've worked cooperatively with the electric transmission system operators uh, for, for those that are, are more in tune with, with the programs that are run. You, you probably hear the Black Sea Regional Transmission Planning Working Group, the Electricity Market Initiative Working Group, right? And together, they're, they're all working towards the same goal, just in different aspects, be it, again, long-term system planning, uh, removing seams and barriers for market integration between the countries and, and so on. And, you know, the, the point that I would make is, you know, USEA, you know, is, is, is an organization, an NGO that engages with, with the U.S. energy sector. And it gives us great expertise that we can tap into to use for USAID programming and, and to share best practices uh, uh, and, and expertise globally. Uh, too often, I, I think the conversation around foreign assistance uh, becomes a bit muddled in terms of just technology. And even today, the, the, the webinar about grid enhancing technologies, it's important, but it's only one aspect of what we do and we're where Will and his team, and, and I think some of what you'll hear about today, right, make it successful is the better integration of technologies with the with the, the planning aspect, right, the, the capacity building aspect. It's not just what we at Abe would call a tech drop, where we think about new technology and then that's the end of it. It's how are we integrating it and how are we making it more useful? So, you know, in terms of the models that we've done, or the models that I should say that USEA and our counterparts have done with USAID support, right? These they're they're used for for long-term planning, interconnection studies, right? So uh, all of the new generation projects that are considered in the region as they come to these, as 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 we're considering integrating them in into the power system or the local, or, or the, the local entities are considering, right? These these models become the basis for those interconnection studies, and that's something that we're really proud of, leaving that legacy. Um, you know, our, our our regional studies identify bottlenecks, right, to integrating renewables, or well, to integrating any power writ large, but specifically renewables uh, going forward. So, again, I, I think this, this again becomes the basis for for the longer the, the longer term. It's it's building into to how the power system is is going to evolve, and so. With that, um, uh, you know, I, I look to the next the next 10 to 15 years, and, and we're going to see an unprecedented amount of, of clean energy uh, coming into the power system, both in the region but globally. And we're going to discover new congestion, right? I think writ large, the region where we work has a well-developed, well-built transmission system, but you know, there are will be local pockets of congestion that are going to hamper a lot of these newer technologies. And so I think a bit what Jay and the other panelists will discuss are possibilities to expand this transmission capacity with a little bit less capital expense than we've considered in the past, a little bit less development time frame. And so that that I think is a real benefit in, in transition economies where maybe where there's a bit more resource constraints. Uh, so with that, um, I think I'll, I'll, I won't say much more. Uh, you all didn't log in to hear me today. You logged in to hear uh, our, our esteemed panelists. So I want to congratulate Jay Caspery of Grid Strategies for the study. I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome if uh, uh, Bruce Jashida, I think he had a little bit of connection problems. If he's, if he's back or able to get on, look forward to, to hearing what Bruce has to say as well. And with that, I'll turn it back. Thank you very much. Well, you're muted. Thanks, Jay. Um, thanks, Steve. Uh, your, your remarks couldn't have teed up uh, Jay and Bruce's presentation any better. 
Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the industry for your enduring partnership and work throughout the years to support uh, Southeast Europe and for your, uh, your support for this webinar. As I said, you couldn't have teed up the, uh, the presentation any better. Now uh, I'd like to turn uh, the floor over to our, our esteemed uh, speakers, Jay Casper and Bruce Sushita. Uh, Jay is the Vice President at Grid Strategies, uh, where he provides analysis and strategic guidance on transmission grid planning and operations to support clean energy portfolios. Um, he has over 40 years experience in transmission planning, engineering, and management. And prior to joining Grid Strategies, uh, in September of last year, he oversaw research development and tariff services for the Southwest Power Pool. Uh, in his career at SPP, Jay served as the head of transmission development and led robust transmission expansion in the SPP footprint. So we're really, really pleased to have Jay. He's a longtime friend of our program, having hosted uh, uh, delegations when he was at the Southwest Power Pool from Europe and Eurasia region and traveled to the region to share his experience with us. Now, I also want to take the opportunity uh, to introduce Bruce, uh, since there's a seamless transition between Jay and Bruce. Bruce is a principal at the Brattle Group with over 30 years of experience in domestic and international power generation development, utility operation, and power market analysis. His experience spans a wide range of utility consulting projects, including analysis of operations of power markets, ranging from integration studies for intermittent resources, such as the wind and solar power we're going to speak about today, to ancillary services studies, operational logic studies, and analyses required for regulatory proceedings. Uh, he holds two MS degrees from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one in electrical engineering and computer science, and the other in technology and policy. We're really fortunate to have uh, Jay and Bruce join us today for this, I think what's gonna be a fantastically interesting webinar. As I said earlier, they're taking this uh, presentation all around the world is receiving a lot of attention. I think they've got some really important uh, things to tell us about transmission and uh, I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to Jay. Uh, I would just say, uh, if you'd like to ask questions, please submit them in the chat and we will, I will read them out uh, um, uh, toward the end of the presentation uh, time allowing. So Jay, thanks to you and Bruce for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Will, and uh, thanks, Sheila, and um, thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's great to, to I, I wish we could meet together personally. Um, I, I've had tremendous uh, experiences in my life traveling and, and being part of uh, USEA and USAID projects and programs in, in uh, the Black Sea region, as, as well as uh, Southeast Europe, and uh, I hope you find this of interest. I'm sorry, Bruce says, camera's not working, but uh, him and I are gonna tag team this. And uh, he's gonna give a lot of background and I'm gonna focus in on the study that was done at Southwest Power Pool. And just for some background, for those that may not have experience or knowledge about SPP, um, Southwest Power Pool is kind of the uh, premier wind and solar resource regions in the central US. Um, SPP, I remember when we started, Bruce and I working together on wind integration studies over 15 years ago. We were looking at penetration scenarios of 20 and 30%. And I remember we couldn't even get a 40% model to solve. Um, hard to believe, but SPP has reached levels approaching 85% wind penetration across its 14 state footprint. Just a tremendous success. Um, and it, it actually, um, speaks volumes to the importance of regional planning, the importance of market evolution, and uh, the criticality of, of having robust transmission systems to enable you to integrate diverse resources over broad footprints. Um, so we're gonna talk about a study here that's been shared a lot in the last few months, and actually will be shared more. Actually, we have a an IEEE uh, Smart Grid Forum uh, tomorrow, um, we are uh, presenting this hopefully at uh, Seagray coming up here in Paris next year. Um, hopefully there'll be a lot more conversation about the next steps and we'd like to get your input on, on how to move this forward. Um, we also will be presenting this, we have presented it at Current, which is a, a European based transmission planning forum where they're looking at technologies such as um, dynamic line ratings, such as advanced power flow controllers, 
as well as topology optimization. Those are the three technologies that we're focusing on here as part of this Watt Coalition study. And uh, there, there are other technologies too. And sometimes they're called uh, advanced transmission technologies and not grid enhancing technologies. So there's there's different acronyms in different parts of the world. Um, but in essence, the, these these assets, these technologies, these sensors, these algorithms are uh, enabling us to integrate more renewables quicker and to take better advantage of the latent capacity in the existing networks um, that maybe, uh, maybe we have phantom congestion. Maybe it's really not congestion, but we think it is because of static ratings or, or outdated protocols on how we operate and manage the grid. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Bruce Tashida and let him speak, give some background, and then we're gonna dive into the study and the results. Uh, I look forward to the conversation. I encourage you to uh, put some questions in the chat. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bruce and uh, I'm gonna turn my picture frame off so you can focus on his words and his slides and I'll be back. Bruce, it's all yours. Thank you, Jay. And uh, thank you all for uh, allowing me to present along with Jay. I apologize, somehow my camera's not working, but my microphone is. So the microphone and the camera are on the same same equipment, so I don't know what's going on. So please excuse me for not showing myself. Uh, as Jay said, we were gonna talk about the different technologies that can be applied to transmission today. Uh, this is just one case study. These technologies can be applied to multiple different ways and uh, provide multiple benefits. In this case, we're just showing how it can help you integrate more renewables. So without further ado, I think I'd like to jump into the presentation. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the common industry goal, no matter where you are, which part of the country you are, or which part of the world you are, and what kind of market structure you have, is constantly to improve the dispatch and fuel efficiency of the system while maintaining reliability. The fuel efficiency in a lot of ways can mean that uh, you're reducing out of the merit dispatch. The most uh, representative out of the merit dispatch is renewables, and replacing that renewables with thermal uh, thermally uh, fueled uh, uh, generation, uh, partially because it's caused caused by transmission congestion. And uh, this, this presentation is looking at how we can potentially eliminate that. Now, the elimination comes in two flavors. One is in the long run, where, the, where you can um, unbottle the transmission congestion so that you, you can get more lower cost resources. And that's in the planning uh, time frame. Um, and there's there's two flavors to it. One is that uh, renewables can be installed in within months or years, while transmission takes five years, sometimes decades or even longer. So one option is to eliminate that uh, time lag through the usage of these advanced technologies. And furthermore, it increases the market efficiency because there's a lot of renewable projects that are canceled just because of the high expected value, high expectations of curtailments or the long time lag that's caused by the new transmission coming in and the renewable developers don't just have that patience. They rather build something elsewhere. And so there's that inefficiency that can also be sold through these technologies. And then there's the short run where you can actually reduce the curtailment of existing uh, renewables just because you're uh, you're avoiding their transmission constraint. Now, this presentation focuses on the long run, how you can integrate lower cost resources through these uh, advanced technologies, but the technologies can also help in other means. Uh, it can complement transmission buildups. For example, if you are having a transmission project that is causing a outage to interconnect that new line, you can use these technologies to reduce the impact of that, of that outage. Or oftentimes what people find is that when they build a uh, high voltage system, the underlying lower voltage system uh, shows unwanted consequences and you're seeing new congestion patterns that you did not anticipate before. So these technologies can help you mitigate those while you're coming up with a um, permanent solution. In any case, the benefits of these grid enhancing technologies that we're gonna be talking about today are that they can be installed quickly and cost effectively. It, it'll help maximize the capability of the existing transmission system. Again, today we're gonna to be talking about how it will help integrate uh, renewable resources. 
but uh, the benefits are in the short term, um, not necessarily limited to what we're going to be talking about today. So with that, next slide, please. This is a map of the U.S., and every place where you see a green shows areas, whether it's a federal jurisdiction, a state jurisdiction, or local uh, jurisdiction, including the utilities by themselves, that have uh, renewable resource uh, targets, and many times it's uh, associated with carbon reduction. You can see that most of the areas within the, uh, the populated parts of the U.S. have some kind of goal. And increasing the renewal projects not only help with these goals, but they do help with the uh, job security and other local benefits that, to help uh, boost the economy out from the current COVID downturn it's facing. So with that background in mind, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, one of the issues that we want to talk about are what are the roadblocks? Um, one is that the utilities and system operators do have a good understanding of uh, the renewable resources. As Jay was saying, uh, Jay and I did the SPP wind integration study back in 2008 or 9. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in those days, everyone was freaking out that 10% of renewables is going to collapse the grid. As Jay said, we couldn't even come up with a power flow case to solve for the 30% and 40% case. But uh, we confirmed that uh, in those days, 20% would not cause an impact. And to get to 40%, you need to enhance your transmission system. SPP in those times was primarily a 138 kV system. Um, now it's a mesh of double circuit 345 kV systems that's allowing a lot of wind to be collected all over the, the, the footprint and sent to the different um, different uh, load centers. I think uh, most recently, they uh, last year, they, they uh, nominated wind as a number one resource in terms of the generation mix. And uh, most recently, they surpassed on an instantaneous moment 80% of the uh, generation from wind. Now, uh, with that said, transmission availability has been a major limiting factor. Even in SVP, where you have uh, double circuit 345 kV systems that are helping all these uh, renewable integration, there's a huge backlog in the generation interconnection queue. And part of this is caused because of the timing gap. Renewables can be developed pretty quickly. Uh, transmission line takes sometimes years to decades, especially the bigger projects. And the other issue is that the utility scale renewables are typically most more cost effective on a per dollar per megawatt hour basis compared to distributed resources. But the re utility scale renewables, despite the fact of their efficiencies, are the ones that are suffering from the time gap or the availability of transmission, unlike the distributed resources. So it also has a policy implication on how you want to integrate more renewables or encourage more renewables. And so again, today's presentation is how can these grid enhancing technologies help integrate more renewables? Next slide, please. Um, so before we go into the actual documentation, uh, we we'd like to talk about what the potential benefits of these grid enhancing technologies are. The picture on the right hand side shows a white paper that we uh, we filed at, at at FERC as part of uh, one of FERC's inquiries, saying what kind of um, technologies are out there. And through this study, the white paper to the right, we found that in many cases, the regional benefits, whether it's SPP or PJM or ISO New England or, or elsewhere, the regional benefits of these technologies are in the tens to hundreds of million dollars. Um, the PJM study indicates over $100 million of production cost savings in real-time markets. Pacific Gas and Electric showed that 2,000 DSRs, it's called the distributed series reactors, it's very close to what we call the advanced power flow control that we'll uh, introduce next uh, would cost about 75% cost savings compared to reconductoring. And so that's close to 100 million right there. There's a lot of European studies that indicate the dynamic land ratings contribution to reduction of wind curtailment. Uh, most of them are in the, in the range of 15% or so. And the quick implementation has been shown to help them with the fast clean energy transition. And um, while all these benefits are there, there's other benefits that uh, people do not talk about because it's very hard to monetize them. 
First is that it increases the operational awareness of the system while providing redundancy and resiliency. And furthermore, it's a relatively a useful tool to uh, help cash stranded utilities that need to invest to accommodate the low growth, but they don't have that cash. And if you think about what's going on today with all the electric vehicles and load electrification, the load is likely going to increase and you will likely need to add more re uh, generation resources. Hopefully a lot of them will be renewable so that you do not increase the, your carbon footprint. And also um, uh, it, it's the lower cost option uh, according to a lot of studies out there. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll talk about three different technologies in this study. The first one is topology optimization. Topology optimization is a software solution. It is effectively using the existing software that's looking at the grid and opening or closing circuits to allow increased flows or, or preventing bottlenecks of the transmission system. In a lot of cases, it's counterintuitive because when you open a line, you naturally think you're reducing the amount of power that can flow across that uh, interface. But in many cases, congestion today is caused by the lower voltage lines that do not have enough capacity. And by opening that line, you are redirecting the flow to the higher voltage lines. And the examples here shows that by opening or closing uh, new lines, you are effectively increasing the transfer capability between different regions that are leading to grid resiliency and reliability or reduction in production costs or transfer capability altogether. And I won't go into the details, but again, as, as we saw in the previous slide, the benefits are in the tens to hundred dollars millions uh, <clears throat> per year range, which is a lot similar to establishing a deregulated wholesale market. Next slide, please. Dynamic land rating is perhaps West, uh, best known. Uh, back about 10 years ago, Encore, did a, the, the Encore, which is a Texas utility, did, did a study on the dynamic land rating. They showed that uh, dynamic land ratings between 5% and 25% uh, higher transfer capability. But they also showed that if you increase the current uh, grid transfer by 10%, you're effectively eliminating most of the congestion that's out there. So. According to the Encore test, if, if uh, 1 20th, that's only 5% of the ERCOT transmission line, ERCOT is a, is a wholesale market in Texas, were outfitted with dynamic line rating, the annual savings from the congestion rec, uh, reduction would be about 20 million. That's with 5%. So if you do the whole thing, that's about 400 million right there. Other examples uh, in the US includes Entergy, where Entergy confirms that on average, 10% increase in the dynamic line rating capability applied during off-peak off uh, periods would introduce a line, line, rating, uh, line capacity increase about 10%. Again, if you look at what Encore said, 10% eliminates all the uh, congestion that's existing out there. PJM and Live Vision studies showed a congestion cost savings of 4 million annually for a one-time DLR installation at about half a million dollars. So the payback period is pretty short. Uh, Line Vision and Southwest Powerpool also showed $18,000 for a five-year, a five-hour period. So again, the the cost-benefit um, ratio is quite large. Uh, finally, uh, this is for the European uh, grid, but Elia, the Belgian transmission operator has deployed a utility-wide DLR system with 30, uh, 30 transmission lines. And they uh, had about a quarter of a million uh, euro savings during a four hour event. So you can see the effectiveness of these investments. Uh, next slide, please. The final technology we're gonna talk about is advanced power flow control. This is very similar. This is what people often refer to as the flexible alternative current transmission systems or fax devices, but it's a modular version of that. And uh, it is something like a, imagine something like a modular phase angle regulator or phase shifter uh, transformer. Uh, the DSR example that I gave you in the previous slide is one sort of that. 
Um, there's other types of uh, fax devices, but these are modular uh, electronic devices that will inject or withdraw voltage to a given uh, section of the equipment and reroute the flows uh, to, to your likings. So uh, the UK example here has enabled close to 100 uh, megawatts of renewable resources to be connected without any new electric cable or substations and has saved about 8 million uh, pounds to date for the customers. Uh, this was two years ago, so it's about 4 million pounds a year. Uh, there's a DMV GL study uh, that uh, shows that if you deploy fax devices to the PJM system, uh, assuming that there's going to be 30% renewables in PJM, then the annual combination of the savings is close to $900 million a year. Now, whether you agree with these uh, calculations or not is a different story, but you can actually see that the benefits are humongous. Even if there's a error range of 10, you're still talking close to $100 million a year. So with these technologies, I'd like to uh, go into the study. Next slide, please. Uh, before I hand over to Jay, I, I'd like to kind of give you the outline of the, story, of, of the study. The slide that you show here is the cover page of the public uh, version of the report. It's available at the link at the bottom. What we did was we looked at the Southwest Power Pool. Uh, there's roughly nine gigawatts of renewables that are awaiting an inter inter interconnection queue with uh, the IAs already assigned. Nine gigawatts is ready to go if conditions allowed. So we looked at the three grid enhancing technologies that uh, we I, I just introduced to you. It was done, the analysis was done in order of dynamic ratings, um, topology optimization, and then advanced power flow control. The orders matter because the first one that comes on uh, takes a low hanging fruit. We arbitrarily chose these orders. So please do not use the study to try to figure out which uh, technology is more beneficial or which technology is superior. The analysis that we did was for the combination of the three. Also, we analyzed the calendar year of 2025. That's uh, within four years from now. The, the nine gigas of uh, interconnection queue bottlenecks is probably gonna increase, but 2025 is not just enough time to build new transmission uh, to accommodate those. So we're looking at 2025 uh, for the Southwest Power Pool system focused on Kansas and Oklahoma where the major load is see how much of the nine gigawatts of renewable uh, in the interconnection queue that are bottleneck today can be uh, released and added to the system and what the benefits are. Jay? Thanks, Bruce. That was a great setup. And uh, I, I really um, appreciate your friendship and your technical expertise. You guys at the Brattle Group have done some tremendous work in this study. And um, actually, this study was one of the reasons I joined Grid Strategies and, and left Southwest Power Pool in September of last <laughs> fall um, to get more involved and, and more engaged in educating uh, stakeholders and, and and uh, regulators and policymakers about the benefits of grid enhancing technologies as an example. So this study was sponsored by the Watt Coalition and we can go on to the next slide if you don't mind. But the Watt Coalition is, uh, Watt stands for Working uh, for Advanced Transmission Technologies. It's a nonprofit organization and uh, some great companies there and, and vendors and, and really smart people that help you understand the capabilities and the benefits of, of deploying new technologies and, and sensors and software to help us uh, get the most out of the current grid and the planned grid, as well as help manage, as Bruce mentioned, all these outages that are going to be taking place to rebuild the aging grid that uh, needs to be replaced. Um, the purpose, I guess, of the, the Watt Coalition study and, and other efforts is to spur policymakers to put incentives in place to promote deployment of these technologies where it makes sense. This study was sponsored by um, um, Grid Lab, who's a wonderful organization that, that does a lot of advocacy work on uh, on environmental and uh, the, the benefits of clean energy deployments, as well as EDF Renewables, NextEra Energy Resources, as well as Duke Energy Resources. Thanks to those companies for putting up the money and helping us fund this kind of work. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to get into the study um, and talk about why we did what we did and what were the results. And, and Bruce 
laid a lot of the foundation, so I don't need to spend a lot of time talking about the different technologies. One thing I, I do want to mention, um, even though we use the same term, for example, dynamic line ratings or DLRs, some people don't take full advantage of that technology, even though they might call it dynamic line ratings. A, an example is um, the Intergy um, experience to date has been based on ambient adjusted ratings for transmission lines, which, which just captures the temperature effects on the conductors. And as most planning engineers and the transmission design engineers know, the, the biggest factor in cooling conductors is not the ambient temperature, but rather the wind speed and the convection and, of, and, and cooling uh, of the conductors due to the wind. Um, and, and very conservative wind assumptions are typically used in static ratings for, for conductors. So if you look at uh, a planning model or even operations model that doesn't have dynamic line ratings, you may be grossly understating the capacity of the system before you hit safe or limits that, that should be reflected of safe and, and you don't wanna damage the equipment either by overheating. But anyway, we've talked a little bit about grid enhancing technologies and how we can use them to complement new transmission assets as well as how do we integrate more transmission based on the current and planned upgrades um, so we're going to talk about that as well as advanced power flow control and topology optimization let's go on to the next slide if you will and a uh, little bit more of the overview of the study you know why did we study kansas and oklahoma portions of of southwest power pool um, these regions are are rich in wind resources and have significant cap capabilities of, of solar development too. But in the planning studies at Southwest Power Pool, they've identified constraints in Southeast Kansas as well as Eastern Oklahoma that need to be addressed and will be addressed with plans, but the majority of those major upgrades are, are five or six years out. So what we wanted to do was for this study was to look at the combined aggregate impacts of these three grid enhancing technologies and the ability to accelerate the integration of wind and solar projects that are already have already gone through the study process. There's nine gigawatts of wind and solar resources in Kansas and Oklahoma that are just sitting there. Um, and they we wanted to see, well, how many of those projects that are sitting there could be um, integrated into the system and maintain reliable service and meet reliability criteria um, with and without grid enhancing technologies. And then we'd look at how many, how much energy we'd get out of those resources, what are the economic benefits, as well as what are the environmental benefits. I'd like to go on to the next slide and talk a little bit about the study approach. Um, so, so this study, like we said, looks at the combined aggregate benefits of these three enhancing grid enhancing technologies. Um, and we actually started with actual operational models. And, and Bruce and his team um, collected um, EMS model snapshots in time in 2019 and 2020 to be representative of what we think the system could and should see in terms of curtailments over the next five, 10 years. Um, these actual snapshots were, were binned and, and, and with similar amounts of curtailment and uh, and, and Bruce did a lot of great work here on the statistical significance of these snapshots to make sure that they were balanced, to make sure that we didn't have all, you know, spring nighttime models here. We, we've got different models across the different seasons, across different times of day, as well as as uh, as, as of different seasons, as I mentioned. Um, so th there are different models to, to represent the different system conditions as well as the weather patterns as well as the load patterns resource mix that we would see across a calendar year so we updated those models to reflect known and approved transmission projects and it's not just projects that were driven by economics and reliability of the planning process at spp those are all good projects but it's also projects sponsored by wind developers people that are actually willing to fund projects because they know that when the maintenance outage or some configuration of, of topology and generation mix on the system, they're gonna see constraints. They're gonna adversely affect their resources. So they, they actually fund those projects up front 
and those projects get installed. So projects like that are also in the models, as well as retirements of existing resources and new um, changes that are gonna happen to the topology, um, as well as the load mix and the resource mix. So what, what Bruce did was run a whole bunch of security constrained optimal power flows. One to create the base case for each of these snapshots that are updated models, as well as what would happen if we started to deploy DLR and then optimize the implementation of DLR, then moved on and said, okay, now what if we use topology optimization on top of the DLR, how much more wind could we integrate? And then he iterated some more and then he got a good optimal model with DLR and topology optimization. And then he said, okay, and now let's add advanced power flow control and see if we can uh, push and pull more power on the system to even get more renewables and still be within the reliability requirements. And then accessing those benefits against um, the economic values that are provided in terms of production cost savings, jobs and tax benefits and all of that, as well as the environmental benefits of these, these simulations. So they're based on real models that have been updated and um, a lot of power flow analysis not production cost kind of analysis yet. We think we want to do that in the next phase, but we wanted to get a, a first pass at this. You know, I'm an engineer and I, I did expect to see significant improvements from these technologies, but but not nearly what we've seen. Um, and I'd love to talk to you more about that and get some questions and conversation going. So I do encourage you to add questions into the chat. Let's move on to the next slide. Talk a little bit more about the approach. And uh, I think I've covered some of this. You know, we, we had to make some assumptions about thermal unit dispatch. Um, Bruce made some pretty conservative assumptions about how much um, of the gas fleet and coal fleet could we bring down to, uh, to be displaced by renewables. One of the things about these simulations, they're conservative in that, you know, we didn't allow anything to be optimized or improved in the adjacent systems. So we, we actually allowed these technologies to be deployed within the SPP footprint. But of course, you know, it's an AC system primarily in the Eastern interconnection of the US. And there are benefits, uh, you know, to upgrades to that would flow to neighbors too, or that neighbors could use these technologies and improve the interfaces between systems. We didn't look at that at all. So we focused solely on the uh, optimization of of the renewable integrations with these technologies within the SPP footprint. So we didn't look at seams issues and, and I think there's huge opportunities there. The other thing about the, the analysis, you know, it seems that there's about a uh, a business case when, when a wind farm gets over 5% curtailments, it's not viable. So we, we took that into consideration in this analysis and we, uh, we were um, cognizant of the practicality of, of wind curtailments and if projects weren't viable then we didn't consider them in the solution so but the curtailments of wind wind projects in these models is driven primarily by transmission congestion which the the grid enhancing technologies can solve as well as the minimum generation constraints for the other thermal resources and, and that's a much bigger issue right now we're just going to focus on transmission constraints that could be fixed by grid enhancing technologies Let's go forward to the next slide and talk a little bit about the results. And um, so on the upper right, you can see that the, this is a breakdown of the queue and what projects are just waiting to be integrated into the system. You can see that there's 3.4 gigawatts of wind in Kansas that is sitting in the queue, a little bit of solar, and, and uh, a lot more wind in Oklahoma, about 5.8 gigawatts. And again, a little bit of solar for a combined of a little bit over 9.8 of uh, one seven gigawatts of wind 260 megawatts of solar is, that, that add up to 9.4 gigawatts of renewable projects that are waiting in the queue with signed interconnection agreements and just ready to move forward um so what did we find in the base case in the lower left so if we just move forward and looked at the reliability criteria you know n minus one and voltage limits are going to be um honored in in a technical analysis with this power flow analysis we can see that we could integrate about 1.7 gigawatts of wind in, in Kansas and a little less than 800 megawatts of wind in Oklahoma to get about 2.5 gigawatts of wind and about 100 megawatts of solar for 2.6 gigawatts of, of new renewables can be integrated with the current approved plans. That's the base case. Now, 
what happens if we add grid enhancing technologies in these optimizations? And you can see in the middle part that we can add a, a couple hundred megawatts of wind in Kansas, but we get a tremendous boost in the amount of wind that we could add in Oklahoma, about 2.4 gigawatts of additional wind would be um, accommodated in a reliable and secure manner as, as a result of grid enhancing technologies in Oklahoma. You can see that in aggregate, you know, we can add more than double the amount of wind integration that could be attributed to the grid enhancing technologies in a, in a conservative engineering type analysis. Let's go forward. I think the next slide kind of drills into those details in words. Um, in addition, it focuses a little bit on the energy. So we got 2.67 gigawatts of new renewables that can be added to the system. That's almost nine gigawatt, 9,000 gigawatt hours of energy. Uh, most of that is wind. There's a little bit of solar. One of the things that we found in this study, and it shouldn't be surprising, is that uh, the grid enhancing technologies not only facilitate new wind, but they also um, minimize curtailments for existing wind on the footprint. And, and that's that's a big deal um, for some systems more than others. Um, so how much does it cost? We, we estimated that the ins installation cost of this equipment, the one-time cost to buy the equipment, get it installed in the field, get it integrated into the EMS systems and the market systems would be about $90 million. And the annual O&M for that would run about 10% or 10 million per year. But let's look at the benefit side. So we freed up over nine, almost 9,000 gigawatt hours of energy. Uh, we made some conservative assumptions that that uh, that energy would be worth at least $20 a megawatt hour. So that production cost savings to the, the footprint would be $175 million. So that that's that's easily a, a two to one payback. That's a half year payback on, on that $90 million investment. That's tremendous. Um, and not only the production cost savings and the energy and the clean energy in the system, uh, but the jobs. We were looking at hundreds of long-term jobs and thousands, tens of thousands of short-term jobs that were due primarily to construction of these new renewable projects. Um, not necessarily, you know, the installation of the, the GETS technologies, but uh, the jobs out in the field to put in new PV arrays, to put in new wind farms. Um, tremendous benefits locally um, and other local benefits equal you know 15 million dollars of land leases 32 million dollars of tax revenues per year from these projects as well as the carbon reductions about 3 million tons of annual reduction in carbon emissions across Kansas and Oklahoma uh, in SPP let's go forward to the next slide about the results and uh, I think this is a little bit of a summary type slide um, same information that's on the earlier slide, a little bit of the detail about why we assume $20 a megawatt hour, you know, as the as a conservative assumptions about the value of the energy, um, actually lower than the average LMP within the SPP market. Um, this is the same data, and these are the benefits to, to the SPP subregions of Kansas and Oklahoma using these technologies. Let's go forward to the next slide and, and talk about, so what does this mean to the U.S.? Um, on the left, you see the the benefits we've we've quantified in uh, or in the right in the SPP, um, and on the left, we've extrapolated those benefits across the United States, and that's based on uh, actual generation uh, output in Kansas and Oklahoma relative to the rest of the U.S. About one thirtieth of all energy generation is in those two states, so we scale these numbers up, and you get tremendous numbers. $5 billion in annual production cost savings, 90 million tons of reduced CO2. That's That totally offsets all new internal combustion engine car emissions sold in a calendar year in the US. Um, uh, $1.5 billion in local benefits and hundreds of thousands of short-term jobs um, with an investment of 2.7 billion in annual operating costs, about 300 million. Quite a, quite a good story to tell and I'm glad we're out telling it. Um, let's move on to the last slide if we can. I want to talk a little bit about the details. Again, I would encourage you to ask questions and uh, look forward to the Q&A. So the engineers probably want to know, well, how many different devices and software solutions were actually installed in these, in these, these uh, simulations? And as you can see, the, the top part 
So it was for dynamic line ratings. Um, we were installing those on 56 lines. The majority of those were installed on, on 138 and 161 KV facilities, as you might expect, to, 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 to relieve the constraints on the underlying system and let more power flow on the, the EHV backbone system. Uh, advanced power flow controllers, you see very few of those applications in substations and on the lines to push and pull the power, but that was the third in the in the trio of solutions that we implemented over time. So you would expect advanced power flow controllers to be less implemented and less deployed in these simulations. Had we used them first, you would have seen a lot more of them. But anyway, we did find cases to still optimize the system with additional advanced power flow controllers. <clears throat> the, the last technology which we deployed in the middle of the three was topology optimization. So how many times, and you only have to deploy the software and integrate it into the systems once, but you need to know how to use it. And one of the things about topology optimization, especially in big networks, is you might find a, an opportunity to relieve constraints in an adjacent system for a topology switching operations in a yet third different system. And, and we did see that. And we see that in SPP in the real world too. You know, sometimes the constraints, power power flows can, can sometimes not be real intuitively obvious of, of how you should reconfigure the system to get the most out of the network. But what we see, we, we notice that there's about 13 actual switching operations per event uh, again, most of those are done at the 138 kV system level and the 161 system. There were pretty tight criteria on how many switching operations were viable at what voltage classes, um, how much load you'd allow, allow to be radialized in these operations. Um, but th this is the data, um, and this is what's available publicly. The, the project sponsors got to see the details as well as SPP staff to validate that these uh, assumptions make sense, that these uh, DLR deployments and advanced power flow controller deployments, as well as software reconfigurations were viable and reasonable solutions, um, but we're not sharing that information with the public for obvious reasons. Um, and, and that's not the purpose of the study. The purpose was to look at the aggregate benefits of these three technologies on real world models that were updated to reflect um, actual expected conditions. I think I wanna just, um, wrap this up in terms of the formal presentation. I'd look forward to the conversation. The next slide just provides an, an outline, I think, of the study. You know, this is a pretty in-depth uh, analysis. I'd encourage you to, to take advantage of it, download it, look at it. Um, let Bruce or I know if you have questions about the methodologies, about the scope, about the results. Um, and, and uh, I'm very proud that we've, we're getting this information out. It's getting lots of interest um, amongst not only technical engineering type people, but policy people. Um, the, uh, the, the whole concept of, of, well, why aren't these being deployed in the US? And it, it's frankly, a, the, the lack of incentives and the business models in the US don't really reward utilities for building um, out the system in a way to get the most out of the current network or to necessarily optimize the economic value of planned upgrades. It, they're, they're put in there primarily for reliability reasons and they're pretty much incremental solutions based on traditional models and approaches. Um, we're, we're a big fan of grid enhancing technologies. We, we, we think they, uh, they have a huge um, potential benefit to help us accelerate the deployment of a clean grid in the US. So these technologies are being used in, in Europe uh, and, and Australia and other countries much more than, than, than in the US. Although we are starting to see some pilot projects and, and, and more and more interest in this. One of the things that the US is, is struggling with are the incentives. And uh, there is gonna be a, a FERC technical conference in September that talks about shared savings and and how would you incentivize the transmission owner who's basically responsible for installing the equipment integrating the equipment and and what is in it for them why why don't why would they not support these kinds of projects so maybe a developer is willing to pay for it because it'll help their renewable market renewable project get to market more with less constraints and congestion um, but the to just sees it as risk and additional complexity and and I would argue that these technologies aren't 
increasing the complexity of the system, but actually increasing our ability to, to manage and control the existing system in a safe way, uh, rather than just make static assumptions about ratings that, that may or may not be right uh, and may impose risks that we just don't know about. So with that, I'd like to open this up to questions and answers. I, I look forward to the, the conversation and any follow-up you guys might have. So with that, Will, do we have any good questions out there? Bravo, Jay and Bruce. Fantastic presentation. We're really, really enthusiastic about your findings and so many, uh, so many interesting applications to uh, USAID-assisted countries and in particular to the region that I work in, the Europe and Eurasia region. Congratulations on a, on a well-done presentation, but more importantly on a groundbreaking study that I think is, is getting attention all around the world. Yes, indeed, we have many, many questions. Uh, we'll see how many we can fit in. Uh, we have a lot of engineers on the call, so there's going to be some questions related to the, the underlying assumptions and uh, sort of technologies in the study. But here's one that's uh, sort of more general um, from our colleague in Georgia, Georgi Buchvelashvili. Buch Georgi, good to see you. Uh, the question is, have you considered battery storage in the study as an option to deal with grid congestion? We, I, I think that's a great question. Um, and I have in my mind that we just haven't done it in the models. One of the things about the Watt Coalition, and, and we do think storage as transmission is another great technology that ought to be part of the Watt Coalition, and we're actually working with storage vendors right now who are interested in being part of that group and being one of the, the solutions for these kinds of simulations. So. I definitely agree storage as transmission should be part of the mix as well as other things maybe but uh, we just focused on these three because these were the the core competencies and the and the products and services that were uh, available readily and already part of the watt coalition uh, team so that's a great question and storage should be part of the mix all right we'll look forward to uh, looking at that parameter when uh, you conduct the next study a uh, question from our colleague from North Macedonia, Stoyan Malczewski. Hello, Stoyan, good to see you. When you analyzed the effects of DLR, how did you go about gathering weather parameters, temperature, wind speed, et cetera? For example, uh, for a given overhead line corridor, how would you go about building a database of wind and, and uh, other weather parameters? That That's a great question, and I hope Bruce is on the line because he can talk about all the assumptions that went in. The, the good thing about our, our analysis is that we actually had snapshots and we knew the exact weather conditions during those snapshots. But Bruce, can you talk about um, the approach in terms of DLR assumptions and, and how conservative the, the analysis was and, and why we think it's very, uh, very appropriate for this uh, effort? Bruce, you still on? Yeah, sure. So um, as Jay said, we, we split the year into 25 different uh, bins. And then for each bin, we chose one power flow case uh, from the historical uh, EMS data, the operational power flow case. And by choosing that, we know exact what time of what day that power flow case was from. So then what we did was we looked at the weather patterns for different locations within SVP, <clears throat> uh, looked at the temperature, the humidity, the wind, either in the east-west direction or in the north-south direction, took the minimum of the east, west, or north, south uh, direction wind effect and applied the DLR uh, effect <coughs> based on those weather uh, conditions that we found for each snapshot. And then we further capped the DLR benefits at 20% because we're thinking, okay, even if DLR can provide a uh, higher benefit, there's probably going to be some other equipment that can be the bottleneck. So we limited the, the benefits of DLR at that 20%, if it ever reached 20%, and applied those benefits to all the potential DLR options that we had. Does that uh, answer the question here? I think it does. I'm sure that if you uh, had a chance to talk to Stoyan, you guys would have uh, hours and hours of interesting conversations. So I'll encourage Stoyan to reach out to uh, you, Bruce and Jay. I think they, and then we'll, Certainly, when travel resumes, we'll invite you to come to one of our meetings and we can have much more in-depth in depth discussions. Uh, question from my good friend, Andre Duplessis from uh, Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories. To what degree 
are grid enhancing technologies or what degree can grid enhancing technologies be integrated into real time wide area monitoring and control systems like special protection systems to balance the grid in real time? That, that's a great question. And, and I wish I was a relay engineer, but I'm not. Um, and I, I'm sure that he's got ideas about the, the limitations, you know, and, and the, the challenges, I guess, with uh, taking advantage of new protection equipment and making sure we're not uh, we're not uh, getting ourselves in trouble by making uh, invalid assumptions about what how much power can flow and how much switching can happen um, on the system. Uh, Bruce, do you have response for that? I, I, it's a great question, and I don't have an answer. We we just need to be looking at reasonable assumptions. You know, we're, we're not letting these these uh, these models, as Bruce mentioned on the DLR, the constraints that were put into these simulations. Um, you know, we're only looking at five, 10, 15 percent improvement of capacity on select lines for select simulations. Um, but Bruce, do you have anything you want to offer in terms of the protection control and coordination challenges? Yeah, so the, uh, there's two two different flavors to it. One is the DLR and uh, advanced tech, uh, advanced um, power flow control that are hardware solutions. So there's one way to apply the hardware solutions. Topology so optimization is a software solution. You do not necessarily have to implement that uh, technology right away. You can have it running next to your EMS system and the operator can look at what the topology optimization software is suggesting and make that decision there rather than have everything automated. So you can take baby steps into implementing these technologies if you'd like to. Great, thank you, Bruce. Uh, a follow up and related question to an earlier question Stoyan asked. Uh, would your strategy of choosing snapshots for PSSE change if you were considering different uh, renewable energy technologies? And uh, he asks, did you use a market simulator uh, to analyze the dispatch of the projects uh, that you considered uh, in the snapshots. Bruce, why don't you take that? You you were involved in all those details and the analysis and why you selected which ones. So I sure. Think that's so good. so um, you know, uh, there's multiple ways of doing the same analysis. I think the most uh, the method that comes to most people's mind is running a production simulation type of uh, analysis for this. Uh, the problem with the production types uh, production simulation is it's under a controlled environment and you're not necessarily going to capture what happened in the real world. So what we did was we split the year into 25 different segments. Each, each of those uh, 25 different bins, as we call it, had equal amounts of curtailments. And therefore, the first bin, which had the least amount of curtailment, covers the most hours. Uh, compared to the 25th bin, which had the most uh, curtailment uh, or most curtailment on a per hour basis, had the least number of hours. <clears throat> so the 25 bins all have equal amount of curtailments, just different number of hours to add up to that level of curtailment. And then for each of those 25 bins, we chose a snapshot power flow case, assuming that the curtailment level and the load level matches what we are trying to match. And then we solved the, the security constraint uh, optimized power flow case for each of those different snapshots. And the way we do it is we got nine gigawatts of renewables. We first add the nine gigawatts of renewables to the snapshot, solve it, and then we see which projects have high re, uh, curtailments. So we take those guys with the high curtailments out, and then we add the rest of it again, solve it, and so it's a it's a process of elimination. That's why we call it an iterative process. And when we when we're doing that, we definitely have a threshold of how much uh, the existing thermal plants can be lowered. It's not based on economics. It's just based on uh, physical uh, restrictions of the power plants and also how they operate today. Because nuclear plants can technically lower their outputs, but because they do not do so, we assume that they will not do so in the study. So in a certain way, it's not optimally dispatched. It's, But on the other hand, the merit order or the cost difference between renewables and thermal units are so distinct, you can say that it is a optimally dispatched system. So it's a hybrid of that. So, so the short answer is no, we did not use a dispatch engine of any kind. 
but uh, the the theory behind it or the uh, assumption behind it is that yes, it is uh, doing exactly what you want it to do. Okay, that makes good sense. I hope that answered your question, Stoyan. Question from Aaron Ansel. Uh, Jay, why was uh, so, was solar so much lower just because there isn't as much solar projects in the queue, or is there a particular technical reason? You know, uh, that, that's a great question, and, and there are, um, the, in, the, in the last couple of years, the, the queue has exploded in SPP with solar projects. You know, wind has always been the, the prominent resource in the, the GI studies. Um, and, and, you know, we've, they've got over 27,000 megawatts of wind farms installed on SPP system. You know, the minimum load on SPP system is about 21 gigs and the peak demands up around 50 gigs today in the summer. Um, so they, they've seen scenarios where, um, where, where wind actual forecasts have, have approached 100%, but obviously that won't work because you have to get ready and you have to have you know, you got coal contracts and self commits for units and nukes are going to run and the hydro is going to run or spill. So you've got to figure out all of that. The key thing about the, the solar in SPP, there's very little solar that actually has been studied and is approved for interconnection. Um, there's a tremendous amount of new solar projects that are trying to get into the study process and to get into have a signed interconnection agreement. I think if you look at the the last couple queues in SPP, um, the 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 solar as well as the solar that's that's a, a hybrid co-located project with storage are by far the the largest amount of new um, generation interconnection requests. So historically, there hasn't been a, a lot of solar in SPP, even though the quality of solar is amazing in the southern part of SPP, but the 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 uh, the fact that the wind is so good and it's such a high quality resource that that uh, people know they can integrate wind and get it into the system, um, and and it's a it's such a high quality resource that um, it hasn't been until recently that uh, PV costs have declined and there's more interest in in solar projects, but they are seeing those now. And the good thing about um, onshore wind and, and solar and SPP is those resources are complementary. You know, the, the wind primarily in the plains of the U.S. Uh, blows at night um, or in the afternoon and early morning hours, um, which complements the solar profiles, which, you know, come up with sunrise and peak during the, the heat of the day um, and then go down at, at night. So uh, we, they are seeing more and more solar. The, the fact is that we, we only had a few projects that actually have signed IAs with solar in in uh, Oklahoma and uh, in Kansas, which was the focus of this study. The other thing is uh, the farther south you go, if you go into Texas or go into New Mexico, the solar resources are much more prevalent. And uh, if we'd done analysis, I think in, in West Texas or Eastern New Mexico, you might've seen more, much more solar in, in the queue relative to wind. Um, but we focused on uh, the existing uh, projects that have signed IAs in Kansas and Oklahoma, and almost all of those were, were wind, as you would expect. I, I, right. I would also add that if you look at the success rate, there's roughly nine gigawatts of wind and 400, 400 megawatts of solar. If you look at the success rate in the change case with the gets case, there's they're both about 55%, give or take. So the the choice of technology was not part of any intention. It was just that those were the projects that were in the inter interconnection queue waiting. And again, the success rate is equally uh, comparable between solar and wind. Good point. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, question from an old friend, Tom Welch. Tom, I hope you're doing well. Uh, how sensitive are the results to reliability criteria? For example, is there a difference between using N minus 1 versus N minus 1 minus 1? That, that's a great question. I'm going to punt it to to Bruce and see if he has thoughts on that. You know, we're we're seeing much more uh, extreme events, and and I, and I think uh, we're seeing outages that are taking extended periods of time just to rebuild the old system. And I think that's one of the most critical things for us to do is to look at deploying grid enhancing technologies during long maintenance and rebuild projects because we know where the constraints are going to be in the near term 
And uh, but I'd, I'd love to get Bruce's comments on that question. I think in terms of the ratio, the the two x that Jay presented is probably not going to change because if you have stricter uh, criteria, it, it'll apply both to the base case and the change case. The base cases without the gets and the change cases with the gets. The absolute value, the 2.7 gigawatts of additional, that may change, but uh, the the magnitude may not, the, the 2x may not change. Good point. Uh, we have a question here on incentives. Uh, are there examples of how utilities can recover incentives by having these investments be considered allowable costs in the tariff regime? Sure, I think that's why we're going to have a conversation at FERC here on September 10th about shared savings. And there has been a lot of discussion about incentives, um, you know, and, and uh, the, the challenge is, you know, if you've got a hundred million dollar transmission project and you get a, a half a percent ROE incentive because you're part of an RTO, that's a lot of money. If you get a half a percent on top of a, of a five million dollar GETS project, it's not that much money. Um, so th that's the it, that's the reason that that FERC needs to we need to figure out how to how to share in the savings amongst the parties that are affected if and when gets get deployed. Um, you know the the TOs may not want to be involved. They see it only as more risk, more complications. You know they they like the way things have always been done, um, but but I don't think we can afford that anymore. I, I really think we've got to find a way to get more out of the current system as well as get more out of the the projects that are are being approved and 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 installed in the new networks um one of the things that we've done historically and, and you know we, we did this back in the 60s when, when we started building out the the 345 or the the 138 kv6 systems you know we started um sectionalizing the the 34 kv networks because we didn't want to have constraints and but as the systems have evolved and we started adding higher capacity networks to the existing aging infrastructure, we really haven't looked at reconfiguring the underlying system. And I think that's one of the key things we have to do in the US. If, if we really wanna accelerate uh, renewable integration and decarbon decarbonizing this economy, we've gotta find a way to get rid of these bottlenecks and all this congestion that's shown up because we've we've had a tendency to just plug and play major upgrades to the system we haven't looked at well maybe we could reconfigure that 115 kv network in in uh, kansas city because now we got a robust 345 grid around it and we we don't need to operate it the way we have and we could still maintain you know service expectations and reliability and security and resilience for all the loads by using new technologies, whether that's macro grids or smart switching mechanisms, um, th there's there's a lot of things we can do to improve the service quality on the underlying system, even if we reconfigure it um, for, for as needed based on the economics. Bruce, you got any comments on that? Uh, yeah, so not to uh, do a PR, and I apologize if that's against the policy here, but uh, we introduced a white paper that talks about the different uh, GETS technologies in, in this presentation. And in that white paper, it's filed with FERC, so anyone can uh, download it. We do uh, present two potential models. One is the Australian model, and another one is the UK model, where there's shared incentives between the transmission owner and the uh, developer. And we're thinking that those two models can potentially be a way of thinking of things, not necessarily the way to adopt it in the US, but as an example of how people may uh, start thinking about how to implement these technologies and go against the current uh, roadblocks that we have based on the current uh, structure. Great. Uh, Jay and Bruce, do you have time for maybe two more questions? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Great. Um, Question from a good old friend, Davor Bias at the Energy Community Secret Secretariat in Vienna. Uh, had you considered an application of just two technologies, DLR, DLR and topology optimization, and how much res could be integrated uh, with the assumption that the advanced power flow controls would be the largest investment cost? That, that that's a great question and uh, if we had unlimited resources and time and money to do the studies i'd love to see the answers um 
I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we need as an industry are, are better tools to figure out how do you really optimize um, these potential advanced transmission technologies or grid enhancing technologies. Um, I'd, I'd love to see the answer, um, you know, that the relative cost of these devices is, is we need to be careful in just looking at the, the uh, what it would cost to deploy them um, because some of them have tremendous benefits and, and you, you want to, I think, maximize the net benefits to the consumers at the end of the day. So even though you may spend a little more with advanced power flow controllers or additional fax type devices, there may be tremendous paybacks. Um, I'd, I'd love to get Bruce's comments on, on that potential uh, scenario. Well, um, I'm not going to share the results for obvious reasons, but again, we analyze the DLR and then topology optimization and then advanced power flow control in that order. And then we revisited the whole thing to see if there's opportunities for any of the technologies afterwards. So I do have that number. I know what it is, but I can't share it with you for uh, for the reasons that uh, Jay uh, described. Thank you, guys. We understand. Last question uh, relevant to this region that, that I work in, uh, more general than maybe uh, specific to the study, but do you face problems with renewable uh, energy integration and congestion because of balancing problems and lack of system flexibility? Or is it simply the queue that is causing the congestion? I, you know, I, I, I don't think there's just one cause. I, I think there's a lot of reasons and, and a lot of things we need to do to improve our uh, operational practices, our protocols. You know, flexible resources are really, really important. Uh, as Bruce mentioned, I, I think a lot of the curtailments, constraints we see for renewables and other variable energy resources are simply due to uh, the inflexibility of the traditional fleet. Um, I'd, I'd like to get Bruce's comments and we'll wrap this up. I think if you look back 10, 15 years ago, uh, people were saying, first, coal units don't cycle their base load, and 10% uh, of wind or solar is going to be detrimental to the system. The, the industry has come up big big time in terms of uh, pr producing flexibility or providing flexibility through generation resources. And now uh, systems with 50% renewables is not, not that uncommon. You see it in California, Texas, SPP, MISO, elsewhere. And so now we've got, uh, we've learned how to take, take advantage of the flexibility of the gener generation resources. We're trying to expand that flexibility into the transmission side. So I think it's just a matter of people getting comfortable with that uh, technology and learning how to use it. And the industry has come up big time compared to 10 years ago in terms of renewable integration by advancing that. So I think another five, 10 years and we'll be there. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and one, one final comment, I, I think it's not just on the resource side, we need to look at flexibility on the demand side. I, I think if given the proper price signals, you know, customers, institutions, you know, industrial complexes, they will do things um, to make sure that uh, they're okay with maybe curtailments every once in a while because of high prices. Um, they, I'm sure that uh, if we could get the load involved more in the market solutions, we'd have better and lower cost solutions for all customers. Gentlemen, thank you for uh, an excellent and thought-provoking presentation. I, I think we have many more questions that could possibly be answered in the time that we have. I want to thank you for your, the, the generosity of your time. I will extend an invitation. You have an open invitation to join us in any of our working group meetings overseas once, uh, once travel resumes, and we'd love to have you talk more about this. Uh, again, thank you so much. Congratulations on a wonderful study, and I wish you great success in the rollout of it and your discussions with FERC to get this technology, uh, you know, deployed on the grid. And it's got so much promise. Thanks again, Jay and Bruce, for all your time. Thank you, Will. Best thank of you. luck, everybody. Bye-bye. Goodbye.